The following program deals with controversial subjects. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Tonight on Sightings, some claim this man is a real live werewolf, and those who were savagely attacked believe it's true. He's seen the transfiguration of a man into a wolf. Then, this woman captured eerie images on film that have baffled scientists. Some say they're UFOs, some say they're ghosts. Our experts attempt to unravel the mystery. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. In a new investigation, we found that werewolves seem to be more than just fantasy. They could be victims of what's known as lycanthropy. Without warning, victims say that they're turned into raging animals. The cause? Well, some believe it's a mental illness. Others, that it's the result of demonic possession. Rational men who turn into irrational, salivating beasts may be Hollywood's version of a classic werewolf. But real werewolves are created by makeup artists. To outsiders, this small English town of Southend-on-Sea seems quiet, picturesque, even quaint. But there are secrets here, an evil that lies just beneath the surface. You can't see what invisible danger lurks here until Bill Ramsey tells you his story. The story began uh, when I was nine years old. It was a very warm summer's evening. Suddenly the air went very cold. There was a terrible stench in the air, and I just flew into the most horrendous rage that uh, my mother and father came out to see what the hell was going on. And the fence post was two or three inches square. It was set into concrete in the ground. I pulled it out and smashed it on the floor till it broke. Uh, well, I don't think I can do that now. My mother and father just couldn't make out why their little nine-year-old boy suddenly started to act virtually like an animal in the garden. Bill Ramsey thought it was an isolated childhood event. He grew up, married, had children. But then the violent episode from his childhood came back to haunt the adult. Strange animal behavior would overtake him, violence he couldn't control or explain. At first, he could keep it secret. But then one day, Bill Ramsey bit someone in public, and the animal inside him wasn't a secret anymore. Soon after, Ramsey attacked a nurse at South End Hospital. I just had the feeling that ultimately I would kill somebody. Then, without reason or warning, Bill Ramsey attempted the murder of a police officer. He was locked up, and his life became a tangle of police, psychiatrists, and reporters. I envisaged being in prison for the rest of my life or in a secure mental hospital for the rest of my life for something I knew I would never be responsible for. The unassuming man with the tragic secret was famous now as the werewolf of South End on Sea. What was causing it? I, I was literally, it felt like just committing suicide. Word of Ramsey's bizarre behavior spread as far as rural Connecticut, where authors Lorraine and Ed Warren were intrigued. The Warrens have documented over 7,000 cases of the paranormal, and for the past 24 years, lectured on demonology at major universities worldwide. Like I told Lorraine, I said, Lorraine, I'm not gonna go before the public and start talking about a werewolf. I said, it's gonna be interesting to go there, see what we can do to help this man, but that's about it. He felt that that was just stretching our credibility just a mm. little too far to believe in werewolves. But I believe. The Warrens went to England to investigate Ramsey's case. They had many questions. Was Ramsey a common criminal? Was he mentally ill? Or was he really a werewolf, possessed by what they believed was the devil? They spoke with Inspector Tony Belford, who was there the night Ramsey tried to murder a fellow officer. What I actually saw that night, um, I couldn't really understand what it was. All I knew that it was something I'd never witnessed before. It was not natural behavior. That night, Bill Ramsey became confused and lost control. He picked up a prostitute and without explanation, drove her to the police station. So I took the prostitute inside, leaving Sergeant Terry Fisher out in the yard with Ramsey. He had these mad, staring eyes 
and this maniacal expression, that's all I can describe it as. Uh, the worst thing was what he was saying, and it was said in a very malevolent way. And I'll quote from the report I made shortly afterwards. He was saying, the devil is in me. When the devil is in me, I am strong. I'm going to kill you. I am strong, and you are going to die. Ramsey lunged for the sergeant's throat. Fisher, unarmed, responded with a powerful knee to the groin. He sort of went, oh, and crouched down, and then he shrugged it off again. He became stronger. And when I came out into the yard, I saw Terry Fisher on the floor, just over in this location, with Bill Ramsey sitting on top of him with his hands around his throat. Then there were bobbies that came to their sergeant's aid, and he threw them off, in their words, like they were matchsticks. A little voice back here said, Terence, you've come unstuck this time. And when you see the size of this ex-police officer, you'll say to yourself, what scared him so much? Why this one experience? Because he's seen something that very few people ever see. He's seen the transfiguration of a man into a wolf. It took five officers to subdue Bill Ramsey, who was not under the influence of any drugs. When I say he snarled and he growled, it was a, the impression of his lips turning up and showing his teeth. And I can recollect actually saying at the time in the reports that I filed that he took on the appearance of a mad dog. Like a caged animal, Ramsey tried to escape. His head, right arm, up to his shoulder was outside this hole. It's difficult to actually um, visualize a head and an arm out there, but I can assure you I saw it, five or six firemen saw it, a doctor saw it, and I would suggest up to seven or eight policemen saw it, none of which could believe what we'd actually seen. Finally, Ramsey was heavily sedated soaked with liquid soap and squeezed back through the hole. Badly shaken, Officer Fisher took early retirement. Inspector Belford was left to account for Ramsey's bizarre behavior. I submit this report for your information and to have recorded the fact that it is in my opinion that this man will, if not controlled, end up causing fatal or serious injury to some person. Criminal charges were not filed. Instead, Bill Ramsey was committed to a mental hospital. Everybody thought I had a mental problem. It just didn't seem right. But I had no other answer. I couldn't say, well, it's not a mental problem, so well, you do this normally then, do you? Does everybody, is this normal behavior? Of course it was, a, it was a mental problem. Where else could they send me? There was nowhere else. After psychiatric tests failed to pinpoint the source of Ramsey's behavior, he was released. What is left? The paranormal, the unknown. And that's where we come in. Warren's told me that uh, it wasn't a mental illness. I had no mental illness. Um, I was possessed, demonically possessed, with a wolf spirit. Um, oh, God. Oh, I've heard it all. And he, he clo kind of closed the evening with, um, would you come to the USA and be exercised? Exercise? Come on. There's some absolute rubbish they were giving me here. But maybe. I'd been through all the other avenues, remember? Coming up next, the shocking real-life exorcism when our frightening werewolf story continues. The lips rolled up, the teeth protruded, and he tried to bite. Bill Ramsey was skeptical about the assertion that his werewolf behavior was caused by demonic possession. But ultimately, in desperation, he made the decision to go to America for an exorcism. A British newspaper paid Bill Ramsey $20,000 for the rights to his story. His private ordeal was now a public spectacle to be played out in rural Connecticut. It was here that the Warrens introduced him to Bishop Richard McKenna, a priest who had performed the dangerous ritual of exorcism many times before. He needed the exercise, you know, no question about that. I would think that being possessed by the devil is, a, is the worst evil that could uh, uh, be, uh, befall anyone. I didn't know what to expect. And when you enter in a realm of the unknown, you're obviously very, very scared. Since Ramsey had shown superhuman strength, six bodyguards with stun guns protected the bishop. Rare still photos are the only visual record of the exorcism. Lord permitted, the devil could easily 
uh, kill the exorcist. As I proceeded with the prayers, he didn't seem to be himself. It was just some other person were, were, were taking over him. Uh, he himself seemed to go, almost go into a kind of a, of a daze. I remember him coming to me, at me with that stole, placing it on my head, and it's as if he'd hit me with a, a hammer almost, because I just did not know anything after that. It started from behind him, and the muscles in the back of the neck all began to enlarge, and the ears began to point, and he howled. Speak, devil. Be gone, gone in the name, name of God. God. Uh, leave him alone. Go back to how he came from. Then the hands clawed in such a manner that no human hand could claw like that. He had begun to make the signs of the cross on his forehead and on his breast, and then he would, uh, he would, he would violently react and snap his hand at me, and, and he snarled like, a, like an animal. The lips rolled up, the teeth protruded, and he tried to bite. How many of you are you ready to come for what keeps you here? Be gone, Satan. Leave him alone. When the devil did leave him, uh, he came to himself. As I came out the exorcism, you feel that you're a new person. The man was freed. The man was freed. I felt I wanted to kiss him, kiss Bishop McKenna, because what he'd done. I believe that I was ultimately possessed by the devil, yeah. Was Bill Ramsey mentally ill or the victim of demonic possession? No one knows for sure, but one thing is clear. What the police, psychiatrists, and his family couldn't help, the exorcism did. Ramsey returned home to England, and in the three years since his exorcism, Bill Ramsey has not had a single violent episode. Coming up next, this woman captured eerie images on film that have baffled scientists. Some say they're UFOs, some say they're ghosts. Our experts attempt to unravel the mystery. Almost every time Massachusetts housewife Stella Lansing takes a picture, she gets unexplained images on her film. Using any type of camera at all, with any type of film or videotape, Stella Lansing records what appear to be images from another dimension. We've all had strange things show up on our pictures. Glitches, scratches, strange patterns of light and shadow. Weird images are bound to show up every once in a while. But researchers in the field of paranormal photography believe some of these photos are actually a window to the supernatural. For 30 years, Stella Lansing has captured bizarre anomalies on film and videotape. Nearly every single time she takes a picture or shoots home movies, strange images appear. Here, a severed arm mysteriously floating in front of this woman's head. Strange facial lesions mark her own self-portrait. A mysterious monk appeared while she was taping a television special about Queen Elizabeth. There's a series of unique clock-like images that defy cinema and time logic and were unheard of in the field of paranormal photography until now. I probably didn't realize that it was any kind of a gift or anything in the beginning. I was just trying to get proof of what I was seeing. I tried with every kind of camera I had. And as this went along, I asked someone if only I had a movie camera, and they let me borrow theirs. And um, that's when I started to get my very first nighttime sighting. There is usually a rational and mechanical explanation for what produced a given image on the film, as opposed to a supernatural answer. The idea that Stella was experiencing more than just mechanical failure first occurred to her while shooting these high-tension wires near her home in Massachusetts. Suddenly, this burst of light came off of the knoll where I was just facing there and shot up. It seemed like in that direction, toward the moon, in the direction of the moon, south, southwest. And as it did, all these multicolored lights were flashing. And that's when I got this object that looks like arms sticking out. A frame-by-frame -frame analysis of Stella's Super 8 film reveals these astonishing images. A group of four men, which photo experts have named the occupants. In the 20 years since this Super 8 image was captured, photo analysts have debated its authenticity. I took the footage of the occupants to the Brooks Institute, the prestigious photography study center in Santa Barbara, California. What could affect a photographic 
negative like that. A straight light entering from a, uh, a small hole uh, near the camera lens, possibly some kind of after effect uh, when the film was taken out of the camera, some kind of a very uh, fine, hard and short light strike that produced those patterns. Eight millimeter motion pictures are so small frame by frame that it's virtually impossible to uh, to fake them without a sophisticated laboratory and animators, you'd have to run a Walt Disney studio to do it. A person like Stella Lansing could not do it. Even more mysterious than Stella's Super 8 image of the occupants is what happens when the film is transferred to videotape. Then, unidentified voices suddenly appear. Analysts could not explain how Stella's silent 8 millimeter film with no soundtrack could suddenly produce sound, replayed here at a slower speed. With no technical knowledge of photography herself, Stella searched for someone who could explain the images in her photos. Dr. Bertold Schwartz, noted psychiatrist and author, took her case and has been studying Stella Lansing for 21 years. When I first met Stella, I became more and more curious because here is a human being that gets these things, the kind of things you read about in the paper, but they're seldom documented as one would prefer. In fact, it was Stella's meticulous records that set her apart. For 30 years, she had kept detailed logs of all her photos and films. As one went over the notes that she had laboriously collected through the years, she'd write on the film boxes, she'd write on scraps of paper, she'd collect clippings, and you put it all together, the story seems to hang together. And we have to ask the question, how do we explain it? Questions and questions and questions, but then it becomes fascinating, a real mystery of the first order. Some of Stella's most bizarre images are referred to as the clock series, images captured on film that surround such things as airplanes and church steeples, appearing at night and during the day. Strangely, when the single lights of the clock formations are enlarged, they reveal spacecraft-like images. And even more astonishing, these so-called spacecraft extend beyond the edge of the film frame. It overlaps the frames. Indeed, the time-space barrier is smashed in some way by this housewife. Ren, the clockwork patterns on Stella's photographs. What do you make of them? I can find some uh, rationale in calling them a mechanical problem in the camera. Uh, some of the consistencies from frame to frame indicate that the exposure was produced not in the camera, but somewhere as a light leak uh, entering the camera or some other pattern. The pattern appears to be very similar, but not always the same. But Stella Lansing still got the clock-like formations when she used six different cameras, two different types of film inside, outside, in daylight, and at night, in five different states. She even succeeded when her camera was switched for another at the last moment. So could Stella Lansing be somehow affecting her film subconsciously? To find out, Dr. Schwartz has subjected Stella to psychiatric evaluations and brainwave analyses. In 1971, Dr. Schwartz himself filmed this breakthrough field study. He and Stella journeyed from Springfield, Massachusetts to Munson Hill to the power lines where Stella first photographed the occupants. Stella's saying, so they're going to come, they're going to come, they always do. And by golly, we see these two orange or reddish-orange globes. First there's one, then there's two, they're blinking, they seem to hop around. Aim my camera at it. I hope I'm capturing this. I don't know. What does this mean? This causes me to believe that either there's some type of mind projection, either she's somehow projecting these images onto the film from her imagination, from her own mind, or that another theory, which is certainly not provable, not by me anyway, uh, is uh, could things exist in another dimension uh, in a borderline way where they flicker in and out of our dimension. 21 years later, we accompanied Stella to Munson Hill, the site of her original photo expedition. We wanted to see if Stella would get the same paranormal images under our own controlled conditions. There's some kind of interaction here. Whatever it is, I don't know what it is. But for some reason, it's just like when I'm driving, I seem to know where to look. I mean, I don't have eyes in the back of my head, but I seem to know when to look somewhere. And I look like that, and there it is. Stella also took still photos of our sightings producer and camera crew and surprising results occurred at the Palmer Photo Lab, where Stella's film was developed. The first thing their technician ruled out was light flare. This is 
this is what's interesting right here. This seems to have solidity to it here. Uh, it's almost an oval shape. And right here also has the same thing. That is really strange. It has all the attributes of classic camera flare. But all the light was behind Stella, not behind the subject. There appears to be some sort of a light source just breaking over her shoulder. But it would be visible to the it naked eye. Visible. It would be like a flashbulb or something. It could have been a very uh, transitory event, very short in duration, where the human eye and brain in combination just didn't recognize it. But the film did for whatever reason. I believe in what I'm doing, and I know there's something out there, and nobody can tell me it isn't. Debate continues on what is actually appearing in Stella's films. We'll keep you updated on the results of future investigations. With the study of paranormal phenomena in its infancy, we may never know for sure what's really appearing in Stella Lansing's films. Are the images ghosts, UFOs, or some unexplained byproduct of Stella's own mind? Coming up, an exclusive sightings update when we revisit a Texas family threatened by a sinister apparition. Sightings, we brought you the story of the Lamonis family of Dallas, Texas, who said they were being terrorized by a ghostly entity. To rid their house of the ghostly presence, the Lamonises participated in a seance. Our team of psychics appeared to make contact, but since then, the entity has returned. We have decided to move. Things are still happening here in the house. She knows that I don't want her terrified, and I don't want the children scared to death. And it's best that they move. The Lamonises can't live with the fear any longer. They've moved out. But no one knows what awaits the next family that lives in this Dallas house. To report your sighting, call 1-900-740-SIGHT. Each call, 75 cents a minute. Average call lasts two minutes, and you must be 18 years or older. Again, the sightings hotline, 1-900-740-7483. Join us next time for new investigations. For sightings, I'm Tim White. Good night. In the tradition of In Living Color comes a new comedy that's way out there, The Edge. For humor with a bite, catch Julie Brown in the series premiere of The Edge. Tomorrow after a full hour of cops and an all-new Code 3. Now, Fox's Friday Night Search Party continues with an all-new episode of Likely Suspects, next.